Rossi's Deo. Dominos Bobby's come. Oh, Deus qui ad onigenitum filium tuum ex ex exaltatum in a terra omnia traheretis posuisti. Per vice papitius ut meritis in exemplo sarafici confessoris tui Iosefi supra termiterrenus terrenas omnes cupiditates Elevati ad eum pervenire mere amor, qui decum ir regnat unitatis trilus sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Nex ubis leviati pali apostoli ad corentio. Fratres silinguis hominum, loqua et angelorum, caritatem autem non abiam, Factus sum evelut es al es sonam, al cimbalum tidiem. Et sia buero profetiam, et noverium misteri a omnia, et omnium scientiam, et sia buero omnium fidem, idu et montes transferam caritatem, dautem non a buero nihil sum. Et si distribuero in cibos paparum omnes facotates meas, vesit radidro corpus meum, ita urardeam, caritatem ato non abuero, nikil miki prodem. Caritas patiens est, benigna est, caritas non emulatur, non agit perperam, non inflatur, non est ambiciosa, non querique sua sum. Non irritatur, non cup cogitat malum, non gaudet super iniquitate, con gare autem garitati, omnia sufert, omnia credit, omnia sperat, omnia sustine. Caritas numquam excidi, si vi profetia evacua bundur, si vi lingue cesa, cesa bund, Sive scientia destruetur. 
Deu, graças a Dominus vobiscum. Et con spiritu tuo. sancti evangelii, secondo mio Mateo. Gloria a te, Domine, et Domine. In illo tempore, loque Father Jesus, principibo sacerdotum, Et fares aes in prorabo parabolis dicem, simile factimus regium tidorum, omni regi qui fetit nuptios filios uo. Et mitit servos ultur cari vitatos ad nuptias, et non ebant veni venire. Niturum mitit alios servos, adicens, dicite invitatis, Ece prandium meum baravi, tauri mei et altiria ocisa sunt, et omnia parata venite ad nuptias. Iliadum neglexerunt et abierunt, alius in vinam suam, alius et ad negotiationem suam, reliqui vero tenuerunt servos, eius et contum elius affectos occiderunt. Rex autem cum audiset irit iratus est, et misis exercitibus suis, perdit omicidas illos, et civitatem illorum succendi. Tungae servis suis nuptie quidam parate sunt, sed quid vitati erat non fueron digni. Id ergo ad exitus viarum, et quos cumque in veneritis, vocate ad nuptia. Et egressi servi eius in vias, congrega verunt omnes, quos in venerunt malos et bonos, nel emplete sunt nuptiae discumbensium. Intravit autem rex, eut vider et discumbentes, et vidit ibi hominem non vestitum veste nuptiali. Et aedili, amice, humoro uc intrasi non abense vestem nuptialem, Adire o motui. Dung dixit rex ministris, ligatis manibus et pedibus eius, mitite eium in tenebras exteriores, ibirit fletus et street ardensium. Mot idem sunt vocati, pauci vero electi. Lausti di Christ.
today at the Feast of St. Joseph Cupertino. We'll be back here again in San Diego. And then uh, the epistle. Okay, so then we'll read here the epistle of the Mass today. And we're taken from St. Paul's first letter of the Corinthians, chapter 13. Brethren, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And if I should have prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I should have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And if I should distribute all my goods to feed the poor, and if I should deliver my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity is patient, is kind. Charity envieth not, dealeth not perversely, is not puffed up, is not ambitious, seeketh not her own, is not provoked to anger, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never falleth away, whether prophecy shall be made void, or tongue shall cease, or knowledge shall be destroyed. And then the Gospel. It's taken that according to St. Matthew, chapter 22. At that time Jesus spoke to the chief priests and the Pharisees in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a king who made a marriage for his son. And he sent his servants to call them that were invited to the marriage, and they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell them that were invited, Behold, I prepared my dinner. My beeves and fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come ye to the marriage. But they neglected and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the rest laid hands on his servants, and having treated them contumeliously, put them to death. But when the king had heard of it, he was angry, and sent in his armies to destroy those murderers and burnt their city. And then he said to his servants, The marriage indeed is ready, but they that were invited were not worthy. Go ye therefore to the highways, and as many as you shall find, call to the marriage. And his servants going forth into the ways gathered together all that they found, both the bad and the good. And the marriage was filled with guests. And the king went in to see the guests, and he saw there a man who had not on a wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having on a wedding garment? But he was silent. Then the king said to the waiters, Be bind his hands and feet, and cast him into the exterior darkness, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. That's by the words of today's Holy Gospel. Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. So today, the Feast of St. Joseph Cupertino, and we have then the considerations of the Gospel, our Lord Jesus Christ, or, Saint, or the Epistle, rather, St. Paul speaks about charity. And we can see that in our age, in the Gospel, we have the consideration of the parable of the the uh, the man that would the, the, the who invited the, the king that invited many to his marriage feast, one some went to their farm, others to their merchandise, and the third group took the servants and killed them. And these are the three groups of souls in the world that God called to heaven. And after he after they and he sent his son, they killed him. Then he went and burnt killed those murderers and burnt their city. And after he did that, he went out and said, Go and find into the highways and hedges and gather those to the feast. But those who were invited were not worthy. And one such one invited to the feast, the feast is today, is St. Joseph Cupertino. He was born in 1603 and died at the age of 60 in 1663 in Italy. And from the very beginning of his life, he was noted for his ignorance and for his simplicity. He never knew anything about this world never understood it, never comprehended it. And when the first time he had, he, he would have levitations and visions from the age of seven on. First time he had visions and levitations, he would levitate continuously. So much so that you know, all those that lived with him 
were usually in a state of perpetual irritation because he was always levitating and always having visions. When he was in school, as a little boy in school, he would see he would have visions during the school, and he would look up into the air in the classroom, and he'd open his mouth, and they called him the gaper. And the boys called him the gaper, and they would punch him, and they would beat him, and they would put candles and put it under his under his hands, but he would not burn him, and he would not react to needles, not react to to any kind of mockery or anything. He would be completely, during class, he would have visions. And they called him the gaper. And so he was, he was, he was, he never learned in school because he was always having visions. And then he fasted. And he, heard, he remembered that the name, the number seven was the holy number. And that we would fast 40 days. And so he decided to have seven 40-day fasts during the year. So he had seven lengths that he would practice during each year. And sometimes eat only on Thursdays and Sundays and not eat any other day. And he always was abused wherever he went. He wanted to be a religious, wanted to be a Franciscan. He went to the Franciscans, and they would not accept him because he was too ignorant. Finally, they accepted as a lay brother of the Capuchins, but he would always have visions and not take care of the animals. and would always have, have levitations. And it said, would anything could cause him to have a levitation. Someone would mention the name of Our Lady, and he would go into a trance. The bell of the church would ring, and he would go and have a vision. It was someone who would mention the name of God, and he would have an, an inspiration and a vision. He would levitate in the air. Finally, because of how holy he was, they decided to ordain him a priest. But then he would levitate during Mass. And then also when he walked the streets, he would start to levitate, and he would have visions, and all the people began to think that he was a saint. And, then, and so in every community that he was, he was moved from community to community to community. And St. Joseph of Petunia was moved from place to place because he was a disturbance. He was a disturbance. Because after a while, seeing a man levitate the first time is really edifying. But ten times in five minutes is irritating. And he would continually levitate, continually have visions, continually see. And he was incredibly ignorant. And the priests would come to him. And they would bring canon lawyers would come to him. And moral theologians would come to him when he was a priest. And ask him the most difficult questions. And he would always solve them with absolute perfection. Whenever he was brought any supernatural problem, he understood them better than the, he could understand. He said any of the greatest doctors of the schools, that is, the followers of St. Thomas Aquinas, when they would ask him a question of theology about the faith, and when they would ask him a question about a moral case, he understood better than any of them. And they could, he could handle the most difficult of all cases but whenever anything came of this world, he knew nothing, and he was completely ignorant. And we're reminded by St. Joseph Gubertino that, that our religion is the religion of God and not the religion of man. And our religion is supernatural, and our faith is supernatural, and there is no other supernatural religion. There are many other religions are founded by men of intelligence and men, of, men, of, men of, uh, who have a lot of influence over others, but in our religion, the true religion, we have men like Joseph Gubertino, or like uh, the uh, Margaret of Castello, who was born blind, and who was deformed, and who was also ignorant all her life. And yet, she converted continually souls to Christ. And Joseph Gubertino and Margaret Castello had this in common. No matter how many times they were beaten, no matter how many times they were mocked, no matter how many times they were cursed, always by priests and by religious and by Catholic men, when this was done to them, they always maintained a perpetual joy. When Joseph Gubertino, for instance, he would frequently be in levitation, he could not hear or react to anything except the voice of the superior. If the superior came and said, Joseph, come out of your leg to levitation, immediately he stopped the levitate. He told him, get back to your chapel. He would immediately stop seeing a vision and go back to his chapel. So many visions during the Mass that they forbid him to say Mass in the church. He can no longer say Mass publicly. They built a special chapel inside of his room with a low ceiling so he wouldn't go too high. And they made, made, him, made him stay inside of his place, and he was locked up many times in many places, persecuted and locked up and mocked. Now here we see with St. Joseph Gobertino, we're reminded, what is it that makes our church divine? God. God makes our church divine. What, what is it that gives our church the victory? How do we solve problems? These great theologians studied all these years St. Thomas Aquinas. All these years they studied St. Thomas. 
But when they had a deep problem, they had to go to the ignoramus. And they went to the ignorant Joseph Cupertino, and they tested him, and they asked him the questions, and he knew the answers because he communed with God. And what about the greatest mind God created? St. Thomas Aquinas. We learn of St. Thomas Aquinas that though he read Aristotle, and he read Augustine, and he was a very intelligent man, one of the most intelligent men that God ever made, from whence came his wisdom? The wisdom of Thomas Aquinas came from the same place as the wisdom of Joseph Cupertino. It came from the tabernacle. It came from the vision of the things of God. That's where wisdom comes from. And that's where strength comes from. We're in a great battle against the enemies of God. And one of the arguments of some of our enemies, like Bishop Williamson says very frequently, the men today are too ignorant, the young boys. They're too incompetent. They don't have any foundation. And therefore, they're not able to be made priests. But those Franciscans and Dominicans, a bishop who saw Joseph Gobertino flying against the ceiling, who saw the ignorance of Joseph Gobertino, but saw his holiness, and saw that whenever you speak of the supernatural things of God, they said, we must make this man a priest. And so after one year, they made him a priest. He was so he was a normal age to be ordained a priest. He was actually 23 years old. He was younger when he was ordained a priest. They, they ordained him because of his holiness. They ordained him because of his supernatural spirit. And then they handed him over to the monks, and the monks were irritated with him. And so, but he continued to benefit souls because of the supernatural. And we have to remember right now, 2017, God is still God. The supernatural is still the supernatural. And the only way to defeat Satan is with the supernatural. He can take another Joseph of Cupertino, another ignorant one, another man who never, he said, he said, in fact, they believe he did learn how to read, but he couldn't read well where he could read a few words, and he had a hard time understanding what he read. But when he heard something of God, when he heard something of the Blessed Virgin Mary, when he heard something of the saints, he understood perfectly. Why? Because he didn't need to read the books. He spoke with the saints every day. So when he had a question, like St. Anthony, when St. Anthony prepared his sermons, St. Anthony used to have a book that he would prepare his sermons with. And he liked this book, and one day it was stolen and the angels brought it back. I think it was actually a, a wolf went and grabbed the thief and grabbed the book and brought it back. And so St. Anthony became the patron of lost things, and since then he's been finding things. But he did not learn much from his book. He carried the same book of preparing for sermons. But then they realized, when they asked him, how do you know so much for your sermons? He said, well, I've got this book. But one day, one day a man went to the chapel at night, about midnight or one in the morning, and he saw the door was locked. And he couldn't get in, but he heard voices on the inside. He looked through the keyhole, and he saw Anthony standing at the edge of the altar right here, and our Lord Jesus Christ as a child standing on the altar. And he was speaking to Christ. He didn't learn from the book. He learned from speaking directly to Christ. And Christ told him what to say. And he communicated with Christ. And he held Christ in his arms. And that's why we have St. Anthony always pictured with Christ standing and his book, that book that he used to use for preparation for sermons. But his book was Christ. You know, the book remains the same today. It's a tabernacle. It's Christ who gives the answer to the problems of the modern world. It's Christ who defeats the enemies. And he goes around looking for souls to come to the feast. Now, why is it that no souls come to the feast today? Why is it that there are so few who love God? Because charity is dead. And St. Saint, Saint Paul describes charity. Sometimes the best way to describe it is from the negative side. It's one of the practices of the church. What is, you know, what is a, um, uh, what, it, what, it, what is, a, what, what must we believe? If any man says that Jesus Christ is not God, let him be anathema. That means we must believe that Christ is God. When you say things negatively, it means that the opposite is the truth, and there's no exceptions. That's why the church in its, in its proclamations and decrees generally says them negatively. Rather than saying, you must believe Jesus is God, some will say, well, I believe he's God, it's just that he's not the only God. So, if it, so therefore, the church has its proclamations negative. And here with St. Paul says in a negative way, what charity is not. And what that means is charity is the opposite. And if we look at all the things that St. Paul says about charity in chapter 13 of the first book of Corinthians, he says, what is charity? On the positive side, charity is patient, is kind. And so everybody, that means charity, there's no more charitable world than our world today. Remember, one of my, I always notice in my own, my own self that the parishioners are the most irritating. The parishioners get the angriest. First thing they always tell me, I'm a very patient person. But, 
I am really patient, but I can't stand it when this happens. I am patient, but I hate people that are stupid. I am patient, but I can't handle this and I can't handle that. But I'm a really patient person. So everybody is patient. And everybody is kind. We're in the kindest age that there's ever been. So in our modern world, they would say, say the positive side. Charity is patient. Well, everybody's patient. There's patients in the hospital. And then there's everyone else's patient. Wherever they go, they're very patient, very understanding, not judgmental, not difficult, and kind. Everybody is so kind. So there must be charity everywhere. But then he says what charity really is. Charity envieth not dealeth not perversely. Charity envieth not. You know that St. Joseph Copertino was tortured by his fellow priests and brothers and religious. He was locked up in prisons. He was not allowed to be with the people. Why? Because of envy and jealousy. They were envious. The people came to see the priest. You want to see the priest? I don't see you. You want to see the one that floats in the air. Do you float in the air? No. Okay, then get out of my life. I want to see the one that floats. Let me see Joseph Corbettino. He floats in the air. And so the priest became irritated. And the priest became envious and jealous. And so they tortured him. And they persecuted him. And they sent him from house to house to house to house. Until he died. Always persecuted. But he never noted his persecution. He never even noticed it. Here we notice Joseph Corbettino. That he wasn't, in this way, he wasn't really a great saint. He was just too stupid to realize he was being persecuted. Most people who are realized they're being persecuted, they can be very virtuous in responding to it. But he didn't even notice. He didn't know anything else. He didn't understand anything else. So he was always happy. And if they threw him in prison, they threw him in prison. If they said, you have to go and you say Mass in the chapel where no one can attend the Mass, that's fine. And if they allowed him out, they find they forbade him to walk in the streets. Because when he walked in the streets, he would float in the air. He got to the point where the superior says, you cannot walk on the streets, because you can't even walk on the streets without levitating. And so, therefore, he was forbidden almost every activity, and very rarely allowed to do them, but always filled with an indescribable joy. And the same is said of Margaret of Castello. We notice in these saints there are many flowers in God's garden. There are saints like John of the Cross who had a great dark night of the soul. And they're a great saint, great dark night, but there are many flowers in God's garden. Joseph Gortimo never knew darkness. Margaret of Castello never knew darkness. They only knew love, and they only knew the greatest sights, and they saw Christ. And remember also, we see their foolishness, because they live out in their lives. What our Lord says in the sacred scripture, he says, what is wisdom for man is foolishness for God, and what is foolishness for God is wisdom for man. Now consider these things that charity is not. They are each of them considered wisdom for man. Charity envieth not. Envy is all around us. Dealeth not perversely. You know that we deal perversely all the time. I remember speaking to a businessman. He says, you know, we deal perversely all the time. This was a Catholic parishioner I had for a short time, about 20 years ago. And he says, you know that I just teach business classes. He says, you know that in business today, we're perverse. And in business today, we live a lie. And I, I tell you this, in every one of my conferences, said this man who spoke with me, and he used to give these conferences to the businessmen. They said, we're not liars, we're not perverse. He says, yes, you are. Because what do you do if you want a report done by Friday? You tell the guy, you better get that report done by Tuesday or you're fired. Now, if you, if you better get the report done by Tuesday, you're fired. He knows that he's, he doesn't get it done by Tuesday, I'll get it done by Wednesday. You better get it done by Wednesday or I'm going to throw you out. And then sure enough, it gets done on Friday. So what happens is he knows if you say you want it to be done on Tuesday, he guess you probably need it on Friday. So, so that everywhere you tell a lie, we, lying is part of our daily life. And we're always deceiving. We're never saying honestly what we can do. We're never saying honestly what we're supposed to do. We live in perversion in the business world, but we so live with it in every daily life that we don't consider it perverse. But perverseness is all around us. Charity envieth not, dealeth not perversely, is not puffed up. If you go to a job interview, is not ambitious, seeketh not her own. Charity does not seek her own. Charity doesn't do that. Like the, like the Indian squaw in Canada, who in the wintertime would find a piece of meat, and she was dying of starvation. She could eat that meat, and she would not. Because the whole tribe was dying of starvation. They did not know about 
uh, preserving of food or fishing. They only knew about hunting. And they were dying of starvation. She would not touch it. She would find the meat and she would go and find the young brave. And she would hand the meat to the brave because he would eat and get strength to hunt the animals. And when he would hunt the animals, he'd bring back food for the whole tribe. She would not even think of eating it. She would hold it and protect it and bring it to the brave. The same with the old man who would find a piece of meat. He would take it and bring it to the young brave that he might hunt to save the whole tribe. Charity seeketh not her own. What do we do? We always seek our own. We're always seeking our own. We want our own everything. So therefore, this world is not a world of Joseph Cupertino. It's not a world of Margaret of Castello. Deal is not perversely, is not puffed up, is not ambitious, seeketh not her own, is not provoked to anger. One thing that's very noticeable about the Western world, when you go to India, when I went to say in India for the first time for a long time, and came back to America, and came back as a sudden shock of leaving India, coming back to America, coming back to Europe, to see the perpetual anger. Everyone is angry all the time. They're angry because the coffee is cold. They're angry because of the traffic. They're angry because I get what they want. They're angry because of their family. We live in perpetual anger. Anger is a place where charity dwelleth not. There's no charity. Why? Because ambition is everywhere. Puffed up is everywhere. Puffed up now is in every part of society. You have a kid who's 675 pounds. He sits at his computer and he plays Madden football. And he thinks he's the greatest football player on earth. And so that now it is not only the man who's intelligent, who is proud and puffed up, but the ignorant man is also proud and puffed up. The man that is strong is proud and puffed up, but also the man that is weak is proud and puffed up. So it is now spread to every part of society. And this is part of the great evil of evolution. Because evolution teaches if you are the latest creation, you're the latest baby, you're the next generation, by that very fact you're better than everything that came before you. And hence evolution appeals deeply to pride and kills charity. Seeketh not her own, is not provoked to anger, thinketh no evil. That's what's called, that's what Bishop Williams and Bishop Sheen used to say, thinketh no evil. Why are there newspapers? Why is there radio broadcast? He said this before the TV. Why do these things exist? So that we love, we love to hear evil. We love to hear about adulteries. We love to hear about thefts. Why? Because when we hear about the evil of others, it covers our own evil. We want to hear about people that are more evil than us. So that my evil is no longer evil. He may be a murderer. I only beat people up. And so I want to hear about murderers. He, may, he steals millions of dollars. I only steal thousands of dollars. And so we want to hear about people that are more evil than us. And it makes us feel happy. Therefore, we are always looking for evil. Thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, rejoice in wicked things that are done, vengeance and hatred and murder and violence, but rejoiceth in the truth, no one rejoices in that, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, and charity never falleth away. Here we see where the prophecies shall fail, and they can't fail, but charity never falleth away. We see today that even natural love, natural love falls away. We are in such a time of corruption that natural love falls away. All the levels of love fall away. Now in this age, what is going to win the battle? All these levels of charity are destroyed. God is seeing all those that are invited to the feast. They are not worthy of the feast. They are not going to be allowed to come. So what happens? God will go into the highways and hedges and gather the bad and the good. This happens periodically in the church. It's going to happen again in the very near future. There's going to be a major gathering session of the bad and the good and the highways and the hedges and those people that were invited to the feast, the so-called good Catholics and traditional Catholics, the conservative Catholics, supposed good ones, they are going to be, their city is going to be burnt. Their murderers are going to be killed by the army of the Father. And he's going to gather in the highways and hedges new Joseph of Cupertinos, new Margaret of Castellos, and saints for this age that is to come of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And therefore we must, must remember that we must live according to charity, which envieth not, is not, thinketh not evil, is not puffed up. And this, consider the, the great, try to develop the spirit of charity inside of our hearts, and follow the great example of the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom of St. Joseph of Cupertino, not the wisdom of this world. So saying, God bless you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
Dominos Hobbies Cum. Per omnia secola secolo Got it. 
salutare di ogni mai giusto ma se come salutare nostri bisogni di piccoli grazie a saggere domine sangue padre ogni potem zetene deus e Christum Dominum Nostrum. Per que maestatum tuam, laudant angeli, adorant dominationes, tremun potestates. Celitelon que virtutes, ac beata serafim, socia exotazione concerebrant. Cum qui vos et nostras voces, ut imidia bias de precamor, supplici confessione dicentes.
Omnia secula secularum. Amen. Oremus. Preceptus alatalibus moniti et divine institutione formati. Audemus dicere. Pate noster quies in celis. Sanctificetur nomen tuum. Adveniat regnum tuum. Via voluntas tua. Sicud in cielo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicud et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentazionem. Sed libera nos amalo. Et omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Pax Domini sit semper vobis cum. Ecum spiritu tuo. Sfintele Doamne Potenții, Beatul Mărie Sfântă Virgini, Beatul Mărie Sfântă Angelul, Beatul Ian Batiste, Sanct și Apostolii Petrui Faloni, cu Sanct și Sfintele Pate, și a peca vine miscogitațiune verbă de opere, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maximă culpa. Sfintele Petrui Beatul Mărie Sfântă Virgini, Beatul Mărie Sfântă Angelul, Beatul Ian Batiste, Sanct și toți Apostolii Petrui Mărie Faloni, Sanct și toți Hepate, orare prome, ar dea unui numit de un nostru. Amen. 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 